Well, hello, friends. Welcome to another edition of Historical Journeys with Dale Blanchon. Today's episode is brought to us by the United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that you can see over my shoulder there in our fine archives building. Those two documents, which of course are the foundation for our government that's lasted for several centuries now and outlived most every other political institution in the world, um, those two documents came to us from the same city and from the same set of uh, the same set of men that that uh, debated and thought and argued and came out with with each one. Let's get right into it. The uh, this is Philadelphia from the air. Uh, it might be one we're leaving. I was privileged to take a trip there with my wife a couple of years ago. I'd never been to Philadelphia before, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is dripping with history in every corner of at least the downtown. It's a very modern city. Of course, the gatherings today are not around a Liberty Pole, but they're around a basketball hoop. They're at the bottom of the 76ers play and, and football, and uh, at the top where the Philadelphia Eagles play. It uh, Philadelphia has its... It's uh, blighted areas, of course, as any big city. It's like the sixth biggest city in the United States. But the downtown area where the historical events that we're going to look at took place is a beautiful place. This is the, the city hall. It was built in 1894. It was the tallest structure maybe in the world at the time. I don't know. At least it was in, in uh, the United States. But uh, a wonderful area in, in uh, Pennsylvania. A wonderful building at the top, of course, is the statue of William Penn. Billy Penn, as I guess they call him there in Philadelphia, who was the founder, of course, of Pennsylvania and a lot of Quaker things. This is the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad Terminal. It uh, being such a big city, there was lots of transportation in and out. And back in the days, I think the 1890s, when this was being built, of course, railroads were the thing. I have no idea why they decided to pronounce their town Reading instead of Reading for all the rest of us, but but I'll have to go back and correct all those Monopoly games I played thinking there was a Reading Railroad instead of a Reading Railroad. A huge barn, that is. You can tell how many people came in and out of the city, several levels. It was built to house trains like this. 1893, there's the date. Um, <clears throat> And it, it must have been something to see the traffic coming and going there. The streets of the of the city in the summertime, at least, are filled with things you'd find in a big tourist place like this. Jugglers and performers and buskers, singers and and tourists having a having a great time. I really enjoyed the atmosphere in the city. And of course, if you're in Philadelphia, you have to go to some place like Sonny's famous Philadelphia cheese steaks. And uh, there's one there. Um, that tasted pretty good, if I may say so myself. They ought to have a right to be proud of that. And, of course, for shopping, you can get any color of shoes you want and a suit to go with them of the same hue. The uh, thing I liked about, one of the things I liked about the downtown area, the historical area of town, is just the beautiful shading and the, everything is very nicely done with brick walks and... and uh, and it's just beautiful. This, of course, is the main attraction if you're looking for history. Independence Hall is in a big plaza called Independence, uh, Independence Plaza or something like that. And it contains dozens of buildings and historical spots, the centerpiece of which is Independence Hall. Independence Hall is the building out of which those two documents that I referenced earlier, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, came. This is where they were drafted and, and uh, thought about and talked over and, and were signed. That building has been standing there. That was originally the, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania State House. But when there was a need for a new Capitol building, the people of Pennsylvania, hoping to convince the government to stay there instead of move on to the new Washington District of Columbia that was planned, they really did a nice job of taking care of the of the government. This is around the backside where you have that bell tower, kind of backwards it seems to me. The the bell tower is the stairway, the grand stairway for the 
for the uh, thing. This is a this is showing the plan of it. The central building with the bell tower in the back and on each side connected by a walkway is a wing, the west wing and the east wing. And uh, that's where the government of the United States resided for about 10 years. Here we are looking back at the door we just came in from uh, from the original scene. It's a grand hall. Uh, they really did a nice job. The architecture is superb. It's beautiful. This is looking towards the doors going out to the bell tower there. Um, but on the on the sides, you can see that it's partly open in some of the places and and uh, over on one side is the courtroom. On the other side is the assembly room. This is looking towards that uh, towards the courtroom, I believe. There it is. Yep. And of course, a lot of things happen in in there. Um, but it's this room on the other side, the assembly room where the state assembly would meet. This is where those deliberations took place uh, when they were talking about the whether or not the United States should become a free and independent country. And then later on, when they discussed the and, and, uh, and wrote the Constitution, you remember the United States had the Articles of Confederation for... Uh, until about uh, 1789, I heard, what was it, 1783, 93 was it? I should have looked this up before I started this. Anyway, but it became obvious that there needed to be a stronger central government. So they got together and in this room with George Washington presiding as the chairman in that spot in the Diaz uh, over on the left, they hammered out our constitution with its its government of three branches of the executive, the judicial, the legislative. And the legislative branch divided into a Senate, which represented the interests of the states as a whole, and the House of Representatives, which, which represented the interests of the population in general. A marvelous document, and it's amazing to me to think of the people, the, the, uh, the famous founders of the country who sat in that room and hammered out that wonderful document. There it is, the Declaration of Independence, signed with John Hancock, who said, there, King George should be able to read that. The other document, of course, is this one. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And then the articles follow that have stood us in good stead for 200 and what, 44 years, something like that. Anyway, those documents, of course, now reside in our archives building. If you if you read about their history, they knocked about here and there. They were put in storage places and, uh, and pretty strange things until finally they built the new archives building. This is back in new in 1952. And they put those documents, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, some other important ones, in that armored car and brought them there with an escort of armed military men. They walked them in there, and that's where they are today. They are in that uh, specially constructed and designed cabinet that on a moment's notice should there be a natural calamity or any kind of calamity was lowered into a secure vault below the floor. I went down there when we our law school class was was talking about the fourth amendment which guarantees protection against illegal searches and seizures. I went down and memorized it right off the original at least partly memorize it. Don't ask me to repeat it today. But it it amazes me, and I, as I say, there's a statue of George Washington out in front of Independence Hall. It just amazes me that the great man sat right there, uh, not on that particular chair and table, but in that place, and presided uh, and lent dignity to the formation of, of that document. This they put have on display there, the Philip Singh inkstand. They are fairly certain that this is the inkstand that stood by both the copies of the Declaration of Independence in, 18, in, in 1776 and the Constitution of the United States in the 1790s, and the delegates dipped their pen. Uh, every one of those 
those names written on the Declaration of Independence and every one of those, those signatures on the Constitution Bill of Rights. Well, not about Bill of Rights, but on the Constitution came out of that inkstand, apparently. This is the, the bell tower in the back. You can see the beautiful staircase, that slope. I love the woodwork in here. You can really tell this is in a federal period or just coming into the federal period. Um, beautiful woodwork all around there. On the west end, I believe it is, of the, of the Independence Hall is Congress Hall. Congress Hall is where, after the country was formed and the government was in place with a House and a Senate, they met in this building. Um, downstairs is where the, in the bigger rooms where the House of Representatives met. And upstairs, here's a stairway there in the front of the building. Upstairs is where the Senate met in a smaller room since there were fewer senators at that time. And of course, this is where they had to this is where they had to keep the nation alive through some of those early days when, when uh, the security of the country was really at stake and it wasn't clear what was going to happen. Many great decisions made in that room. There are also other rooms up there, committee rooms, things like that, that they have in our Capitol buildings today. This, right across the street, out the front of Independence Hall, is the Liberty Bell Center, a fairly new thing. The Liberty Bell, of course, is one of those symbols, national symbols like the eagle and the flag. It's a bell that was rung when, when liberty was proclaimed, when independence was proclaimed. And of course, we know the story how that it was cast by the Pass and Stow Company and, and it had the words of that Bible verse around the top, proclaim liberty to, throughout the land, all the inhabitants thereof. And, uh, and of course, we know about the crack in it. I was impressed by that chunk of wood there. I'm not sure. But every picture I've seen way back of the Liberty Bell has that chunk of wood. I'm just wondering if that isn't an original. Um, that didn't originally hold the bell. Uh, if it did, boy, that is a piece of character, isn't it? It's still holding it today. There's the crack in there with the with a bolt they put in there to try to keep it from going farther. But alas, um, it uh, can't be rung like it was originally. Back in the early 1950s, they made copies of the Liberty Bell and sent one to each state. This is one I found on the grounds of the state capitol um, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I've seen several others, Minnesotas and, and a couple of others too. I'm glad that each state has that reminder. Around town, you find many, many ancient buildings. They have preserved many of them. This one is one of the quaintest and most amusing, Elfrith's Alley, as you can see there in 1736 when they began building it. And when you go down this little narrow street, you are going back in time, what, 100, 284 years. Um, and the fronts of the building look just exactly, I don't know about the paint colors, look just exactly like it did then. As you can see, no semi-trailers going up and down that street. There, these are still residential streets. That has been one of the best ways of preserving old buildings is to use them for modern things, preserving the, the, you know, the integrity of the, of the building as well. But it was just a pleasure to walk up and down the street and use one's imagination. Uh, the houses go right down onto the street. You step through those doorways up one or two steps and there you are in the house. They have the cellar doors to get down under there. It's just a, just a great thing. There's an ancient, there's a little court off to the side where you go back in there, a little dead end portion of the street. And uh, there's a well there. That's, that's characteristic of a lot of those ancient wells, but we're not too far from the river here. I don't imagine they had to dig too deeply for a well. There's another close up of a door and a and a cellar door there. Anyway, that was an amazing experience. Christ Church is an old church building there, but they have a burying ground there, and some of the graves go way back. The one on the right that you see there is the grave of none other than Benjamin Franklin, the famous patriot. And uh, what do they call him, a polymath? Somebody who knew something about everything. He had his famous experiment with electricity when he when he flew a kite into a, a lightning storm and didn't get himself killed. And of course, uh, 
Um, they have not only his grave in town there, but if you go up, turn right up there where those, those folks are there, there's that archway there. And that archway, it says Benjamin Franklin went to and from his house through this original passage to go to his print shop. And, you know, one of the famous things that he printed there is Poor Richard's Almanac. This is the first edition in 1733 and many, many other things. Um, he, was a, he was a great patriot anyway. Here's what you see when you get to the other end of it. This is just what things look like. They had they'd stopped building wooden buildings by this time and, and uh, because wooden buildings were a fire hazard. So everything was built, built uh, with bricks. And uh, it was it was uh, Benjamin Franklin that started, I believe, started the first private fire company in this town in Philadelphia there. The round circles on the ground are, there's one of them that's a well and one or two of them that are outhouses, not very far away if you ask me, uh, where they've dug and, you know, outhouses have always been great places for archaeologists because people way back then would throw their trash in there and trash tells a great story to archaeologists. You can tell all sorts of things by the things that people throw away. So they were happy to find those things. There's some of them there with the, the, uh, the arch over on the right. This is the home of another famous person that's been preserved since, since the early days of the country. That is the home of Elizabeth Ross, better known as Betsy Ross. We know Betsy Ross as the maker, at least the very probable maker, of the first American flag with stars and stripes. If you go in the house there, here's a picture of George Washington surveying the her product there. And of course, he approved it as well. Um, it's amazing to think this is her front room. It's amazing to think that George Washington himself might have stepped in through that door. More likely it was his emissary. Um, but uh, it was in this room and and maybe a little bit if you go up these winding stairs. Stairways tell something about character of the place, don't they? Imagine people going up and down those stairs. Uh, how many how many footfalls have sounded on that stairway? There's upstairs. Maybe she did some work on the flag up there. They're suggesting there. This is a living history place. There's a there's a young indentured servant. I think they said she was. Uh, learning the trade and, and being a servant in the house there. Carpenter's Hall is a fascinating place. The, the Independence Hall is where the government sat in, I think, the third year of its existence. But it really started here in Carpenter's Hall. Uh, Carpenter's Hall was like a union headquarters or something for the Carpenter's Guild. Um, but... When uh, when they had the idea, after the Boston Massacre and after the um, things started to heat up in Boston, they had the idea that co the, the separate colonies needed to hang together, as Benjamin Franklin said, so they wouldn't hang separately. And so they started meeting in a Continental Congress. The first and I believe the second Continental Congresses were held in this building. Uh, if you read about how many important things took place there, how many decisions were made, this is where they, you know, they decided to to send George Washington up there as the leader, um, and where they where they uh, worked on getting the armies in place at the start, and then switched over to Independence Hall for the final moment of uh, gaining independence. This is a, a little bit of ways down, but still downtown. They call this the Declaration House. This is the house where, where Thomas Jefferson was staying. You know, he was the composer of the bulk of the Declaration of Independence. He wrote a copy, and then they discussed it and made some changes here and there. But this, in this house is where those great ideas, most of them were formulated, and most of what he wrote was accepted as a part of the Declaration of Independence. This is Philosophical Hall. <clears throat> now, philosophy, of course, philo, like in Philadelphia, means love, city of love. And sophical means learning, love of learning. So there was a philosophical society in Philadelphia. Benjamin Franklin was one of his early presidents. And, uh, and uh, they met, they built this building. 
In fact, they are still in existence. It's one of the oldest clubs in America, and they still own this building. It's the only private building there in Independence Park. But the building has been used for many, many things. One of them was a fascinating one. Charles Wilson Peel was an interesting person. He was a painter. He had George Washington sat for him about seven times, and he repainted some of those. He painted about 60 different paintings of George Washington. And he had a museum. He had a museum there in the Philosophical Society. He also had it in the upstairs of the Independence Hall. And in there he had, you can see, he had the mastodon and he had quadrupeds and he had all sorts of things all up and down the second floor. And this, this picture is when he was in the, the uh, Independence Hall building. But he was a fascinating person, not just, he was interested in everything, kind of a Benjamin Franklin-like person. But his family is fascinating too. He was a progenitor of a whole bunch of peels. Um, and there were many painters and many thinkers among them. It was an amazing family. I met up with Rembrandt Peel, a son, I believe, of Charles Wilson Peel, out in the Portland, Oregon Art Gallery. And one of the paintings that he did, this very famous painting, he, in order to do this painting, he gathered up, didn't paint it till about 1850 or so, I think, but he gathered up all the pictures, he paintings he could of George Washington, and he kind of made it a composite. The family said, I think that this was the best likeness of George Washington as a result. Some uh, technique there. Anyway, that family was just amazing. Here's a, here's a thing that was in vogue back then for people that couldn't afford a full-fledged portrait. You would have your silhouette taken. There were people who were experts. They'd shine a, shine a light on you and trace it and cut it out. And there you would have kind of a two-dimensional portrait. I guess they're all two-dimensional, but anyway, you'd have a, something of a portrait, and uh, even though you didn't have a painting. This is the old city hall, which is one of the buildings, I believe, on the east end of the capital of the Independence Hall there. The old city hall is where the U.S. Supreme Court met, as it says there, from uh, 1791 to 1800, somewhere in there, before they moved before the new Capitol building opened up in Washington, D.C., and they moved into the chambers there. So all sorts of things going on. This is a National Bank building. The National Bank was a heavily debated thing, and uh, it finally lost its charter when Andrew Jackson, the populist president, wouldn't renew its charter, and they sent distributed its assets among a number of regional banks. But what a beautiful building. There's an art gallery in there now. But uh, they built that to last for a long time, but alas, the bank part of it did not. There's, uh, there's It was used for the second bank of the United States there. This is a relatively new one, the, muse the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, we weren't able to go in there because it wasn't open at the time, but I would have loved to go in there because they had all sorts of beautiful exhibits. This is one I saw years ago in the Smithsonian. It's George Washington's tent. This is the tent that he used to sleep in and for his office while he was on those campaigns. Um, and uh, it's just amazing to think that it's still in existence. I think pieces of it are owned by about four different institutions. Somebody owns the, owns the outside and somebody owns the door and somebody else owns a, must have been a cover on the inside and, and something else, but that would have been something to see again. Um, anyway, one of the places that was used was Valley Forge. And we took a side trip out to Valley Forge. Valley Forge is where George Washington took the army during some pretty dark days. Was it uh, 1787 to 88 that winter? I shouldn't say without looking it up. Anyway, he had two goals in mind. One of them was to protect the army from surprise by the British who were down there in Philadelphia and also to watch the British should they decide to move towards New York or something like that, then he would be within striking distance of them. So he needed a place where there was water. He needed a place where they could, um, they could build secure ramparts, a place where they could be um, supplied without interference from the British. And Valley Forge fit that. If you go down there today, they have this great monument there. Um, beautiful, beautiful monument and more scattered all around the grounds with plaques about various generals and people important then. 
this is interesting to me. It's a pretty big place because they had thousands and thousands of soldiers there. Not as many as Washington would have liked. This was the darkest hour probably of the Revolutionary War for George Washington. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough clothing. People were starving. They were cold. cold. They didn't have adequate clothing. But George Washington, almost by the force of his personality, kept the army together. And by spring, when it warmed up, more recruits came in and straightened out the supply situation and the army was on its way. While they were there, of course, one of the interesting things is, as you know, by virtue of these signs from people who have researched it, you know where which general had, which divisional general had his men. And this is interesting to me because I have an ancestor who was a soldier in Anthony Wayne's division. They called him Mad Anthony Wayne because of some of his exploits. There's the, there's the entire army with George Washington at the top and six generals. Over a uh, second from the left there is Anthony Wayne. That's actually Hugh Mifflin there, but Anthony Wayne was the acting um, the acting general. And one of those things down below is Thomas Hartley's additional regiment. That's the one my ancestor John Barr was in, helping to set the country on its course for today. There's a statue of Anthony Wayne there. I love these classical statues. I don't know if they make them anymore. But down there in those woods is where my grandfather camped, apparently, with, uh, with the other men of his his regiment and his division. I'm sure there wasn't a tree left in sight by the time they got done. They have some representative ramparts around there. Of course, all around this, they had they had uh, protective works, forts and, and walls, because the British could have attacked any moment. And they they prepared against that. And they, they have an example of some of the cannons they use and some the way they built some of the some of the defensive things there. The, it was where they were housed for the winter, so they had hundreds of these huts. Each hut might have eight soldiers or a few more in there, and each one had that, that wooden mud daub chimney, and uh, that's where they spent the winter. If you were an enlisted man, they'd stack you up three high. These boys are showing how it's done there. If you were an officer, you were in a little better shape, more comfortable beds and and a little more of the amenities of life. If you were the commander in chief, though, George Washington, you stayed in this building. It's amazing to me that this building has been preserved. So you can go inside that building, and it is just like here's the the parlor there where George Washington would have sat, and uh, with age rushing in and out, taking orders here and there, and Washington writing letters to Congress saying, you better get some supplies up here, the army will be gone. Uh, it just amazes me to think what went on in that room. In a, in a side room, here's all of the, these are the places where the aides slept. That little curtained off thing on the upper left there is interesting. They had those, those curtains, uh, because, you know, the fire burned down. This was wintertime, and having those curtains like that kept the heat in a little bit longer. I imagine it still got pretty chilly. This room is where George Washington slept, and Martha Washington. Martha came up to join the army whenever she could, wherever Washington was. And I think it was a great morale builder with the troops, and I'm sure she, she did whatever she could to help with that. But she spent her time with her with her husband whenever she could. This is the kitchen off to the side there. In those places, you know, 200 year old places, the fireplace is just kind of open, doesn't have the sides on it even. And a huge chimney to siphon off the smoke and that swinging arm there on the left so you could turn the heat up or down depending on where you swung the bucket to, the pot to. Um, Fascinating to see how they accomplished back then the same things that we accomplished today with our modern dials and knobs and, and other equipment. They have a museum at Valley Forge, and they've collected quite a few artifacts. You can see that frying pan up there with the legs on it. You'd sit that right down in the fire on the coals, so you'd get plenty of heat. They so had some things like that leather shoe there. It doesn't look like it's in too good a shape, but you can see exactly the kind of footwear 
that the soldiers had and the other, you know, bottles and notebooks and shovels and all those things uh, going back to a, to a day 200 and, 233 or two years ago. Anyway, my wife, while we were looking for around town for things to see, she said, let's go see that prison. A prison, I said. <laughs> Why do we want to see a prison amongst all the Revolutionary War things? But we went, and I'm glad I did, because it, was, it wasn't Revolutionary War, but it was fascinating. This prison was opened up in 1829 and didn't close again until 141 years later in 1970. It looks like a castle on the outside, and it looks like a bunch of dungeons on the inside. When you come into the room, the entrance to, to pay for your ticket, you're down in there with all the pipes and the ceiling. It's just a pretty rough looking place and it gets rougher. It was built to, you know, with central arms stretching out from a central place in the middle there. And, uh, and along those arms are all of those, those cells. Their idea was to keep the prisoners isolated as much as possible. So you went in that cell and you didn't go out. You worked, but they brought your work in to you. Here's some of the places had two stories and uh, with the cells going off to the side of each. When you look in the cells, they weren't much. There's a prisoner on the right with his little work. Um, what a way to spend years and years and years or life if that's what your sentence was. There's no way you can put a good face on a prison. So my suggestion is don't do what it takes to get there. Here's a, if a prisoner hit a guard, here was the punishment. Solitary confinement in that hole in the ground there. Does it look like you could expect pretty rough treatment there if you were misbehaving? <laughs> that gentleman in the picture there is just about to get buried under that grating there for two weeks or whatever the punishment was. This was an ominous part of the building opening to an outside court separate from the rest. This is where they kept the worst of the criminals and especially those that were on the way to their execution. What a thing it would be to be transferred to that. There were several famous uh, inhabitants, including this gentleman, old Al Scarface Capone himself. I think this is the first time he was in prison. For some reason, he didn't have to work in solitary confinement. He must have known somebody. He had a desk there to work on with electric lamps and even a radio set and a fairly comfortable bed there. How did he do that? He had connections, obviously. This is a, this is a yard where they, they did outdoor things. Um, but I want to show you some other people. This is none other than Willie Sutton, one of the most famous bank robbers in United States history. He, he robbed something like 50 banks. He escaped from jail three times. And uh, he's the one they said, why, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. Kind of dodged the question. But he was with a group of inmates. There was one of them that wasn't his cell, but somebody else's cell. Um, and there was a, a metal thing on the wall there that they worked off and then behind it they dug a hundred yard long tunnel that went under the walls under the street and out the other side and about or something like 14 inmates escaped through that hole including Willie Sutton he was captured a couple blocks away he wasn't free for very long and all of them were eventually captured um, he was the most famous of them this man, there were about a hundred people that tried escaping, but only one got away with it. Mr. Callahan, Leo Callahan in 1923 escaped and he, he and a bunch of other inmates built a makeshift ladder and climbed over the walls and he was never seen again. He got away with it. So you can take a good look at the picture and if, uh, if you see him anywhere, I'm sure they'll be happy to know about it and in Philadelphia. He'd be a little bit older now since that's about 97 years ago. Anyway, I didn't want to end on a picture of an inmate. I wanted to end thinking about that wonderful Independence Hall and all the things that have happened there. If you ever get a chance to go to Philadelphia, do so and plan on spending a week there if you can. We haven't even got to the uh, 
there's a really wonderful museum called Mutters or Muters Museum with amazing, strange things in there. There's a beautiful art gallery. You might remember the movie Rocky when he's out exercising on his way to his underdog championship. You know, he ran up the steps of the art gallery and turned around and held his arms up in the air in a gesture of victory and looked over the plaza. That's there in Philadelphia. Many, many other things in the town that are, are there to see. And don't forget to have one of those great Philly cheesesteaks. Anyway, that will have to do for our program today. We uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, look for more. should have more programs coming out soon. I appreciate you taking a look at them. I don't know how long this coronavirus thing is going to last, but we're going to keep plugging away and uh, turning out the program so that our friends in the nursing homes and the assisted living places will have something to do other than twiddle their thumbs. But thanks for watching today. Make sure you... Uh, make sure you um, put some comments down there with your criticisms and suggestions. I appreciate those. And uh, tune in next time. So for now, we'll say goodbye. See you later.